Well, I think James... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think James might be a little kind, but um, <laughs> let's see how this goes. Um, so just to introduce myself first, um, I'm Lucas Roper. I'm the lead developer at Opposable uh, Group, basically, and I've worked on countless sort of you know, numerous projects for VR, and including Oculus, Gear VR, and now moving on to Cardboard. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anil Glendening. I'm a creative director at Opposable VR. Um, I've been working in video games for about 10 years, um, I love working in, um, in new entertainment technology. I've worked with Microsoft um, Connect, I've worked with HoloLens, and right now I'm really excited to be working in VR and really excited to be working with Opposable VR. So um, both Lucas and I would really like to thank you all for being here and, and being part of our talk. Yeah, and um, just um, so you know what we're talking about, it's basically how to avoid a cardboard catastrophe. And, you know, it's quite a big, broad question. Um, but what we're hoping for is, you know, our advice will at least sort of, you know, let you know some of the pitfalls and things to be aware of and hopefully make nice cardboard content for it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so before we start, let's just do a, a quick run up as to why we think that you you should develop for, for cardboard. Um, the first reason is volume and market size. There are over 5 million cardboard uh, devices, handsets out there. Um, over 1,000 compatible applications for these and 25 million application installs of cardboard <laughs> VR apps. Now, in the VR space, nothing comes close to that kind of user base. So that alone is a really major reason to consider cardboard VR as a platform. Now, it's also a gateway to casual VR users. It's cheap, it's often free, it's easy to be handed around. A lot of people may not have tried a Rift or a Vive, but if you hand them a cardboard VR for the first time, they can still get a really great experience. Cardboard is really the only way that my mother actually knows what I do for a living, because I can't drag a Vive over to her house. Now, it's untethered, it's unstrapped. You hold it to your face. That makes it really accessible. And getting the stuff that we do in front of as many people as possible is really important to us. Um, so I believe that right now, Cardboard VR is the easiest way for people to experience VR. Now, it's also social and it's accessible. Now, it's interesting to talk about sociability when we're talking about VR, because often it's about you strapping yourself into another world. But because cardboard isn't strapped to your face, it's so easy to take it off and hand it to your friend and say, just check out this cool thing that I took a look at. The device itself has a speaker, so people can hear what's going on as well. So I think that's really important. And often because these things are branded, it's a conversation starter as well. A next really good point is the fact that VR apps have good discoverability right now. Um, the uh, Google Play Store has a dedicated storefront just for Google Cardboard apps. Now, there's some good stuff on it, and there's also kind of a lot of rubbish on there as well. But this is a really great opportunity, because if you have a great product, you can really stand out in what is usually an impenetrable mobile marketplace. OK, so the final point is that it's cheaper and a little bit easier creating our assets for a mobile platform than it is for something that is AAA, which it would need to be if you're targeting a the Vive or um, uh, the Rift. It's also quick and easy and fun to make a prototype on it. And as I mentioned before, you can then share this prototype with people. But, and this is a big but, I'm not going to say that it's easy to develop for cardboard. In fact, I think sometimes it's, it's downright tricky to develop for cardboard. Yeah, and the, that's the thing is really, you know, Anil's just mentioned about all the market potential and, you know, the fantastic opportunity that cardboard could represent for you. And that's true. Um, but it is a double-edged sword in the sense of um, it's probably the hardest platform to potentially develop um, nice-looking content for. And so just to um, explain a bit more about why it's so difficult is, is actually the pressure on the GPU side of the um, device. And the GPU is often the weakest part, you know, component, basically, of a mobile device. And so you're actually asking a limited resource pool already to do basically twice the rendering work. And that's, that's um, something not to be sniffed at. 
But then with that as well is, you know, Oculus have the gear, for example, and they support a very limited range of phones, and that's great, and that means they can do um, you know, mobile content with good sort of recommendations. With cardboard, the, the spectrum of devices, it go back, goes back to Android 4.4, for example, which must be at least four or five years old. And it's like, that's a lot of devices that you could potentially support. And you know, you've got to check, you know, yeah, each have their own idiosyncrasies and things like that. So, you know, lots to think about there. And we're actually going against the principles of what mobile want to do. Um, you know, basically to explain like a normal game, you know, they're so concerned about, for example, you know, maintaining battery life, heat, you know, being efficient and making sure sure your game um has almost as little impact on the phone as possible. But with VR, we really want to try to be eking out every you know, percentage of performance. And we, well, basically, you know, this is one of our interesting things we found in testing is how Android will thermal throttle stuff. So actually we'll say, your performance is limited. We'll actually clock the speeds down of particular um, components to make sure that the heat and battery life maintains. And actually, what was a really nice surprise was iOS doesn't do that, and it just runs for an hour and seems 60 frames per second and lovely. And so that's that's a pleasant surprise. Um, yeah. Um, so that's the broad challenges. And so the next, so the talk is or the technical side of things I'm going to be talking about is focusing really on the GPU end. But um, don't forget the CPU as well. And I mean. What I would say is with VR, there's not the challenge on the CPU in the same fashion. So it's not um, you know, doubling the you know, computation type on the CPU end. And so um, you can relatively treat it as you would a normal mobile game. So as long as you're relatively efficient with your pr programming and you know, um, not doing anything that you know, increases that execution time too long, that's, that's, that, that's great, really. But what I'm really concerned about and what I think is really important to tell you about is the GPU end. So these are Oculus's suggested stats for Gear VR. And this is like in a blog post last year by a technical, um, I can't remember who it was exactly, but yeah, a technical blog basically. But um, the thing I would be pointing out immediately is this is a good starting point, I would suggest. But bear in mind again, Oculus have a limited range of devices to support and can make much better explicit recommendations. Because, again, your device range is so large, I'd be going to the lower end of these stats and possibly even lower if you can do it. Um, but it's just something to really think about. But what's really important before even worrying about trying to get these stats as such you know, in our games, you know, or worrying about efficiency side of things, is making sure the design we use is actually efficient in the first place. Uh, that's right. Um, before you start optimizing uh, your cardboard game, you really need to start optimizing the design. Um, there are some things that cardboard does really well, and there are some things it doesn't do so well. And understanding these is going to be key to creating a compelling cardboard experience. So we're going to give you a few hints here, which will make your life a little bit easier. And this is applicable whether you're making a game or whether you're making a narrative experience or what have you. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, that we're following this talk from, from Manesh, who spoke about Land's End. Many of the things that we're going to talk about in terms of optimizing design, optimizing the art style, are there and evident in Land's End. So, you know, listen to our talk, and then if you haven't already played it, go and play that game, because it does so many things right. The first thing is about limiting input mechanisms. You can connect via Bluetooth um, a controller to your, um, your cardboard handset, but latest stats suggest that only about 5% of people actually do this. So right now, it just makes no sense to develop anything that requires an additional controller. So what does that leave you with? Well, you have a single button on top of a cardboard device. Great, no. Don't use it. There are a lot of different types of cardboards out there, and some of them are less robust than others. It just takes this little cardboard button to fail once for your users to start getting frustrated with. So what does that leave you with? Well, it leaves you with gaze. And gaze control is something that works really well, particularly on cardboard. Simply look at what you want to interact with, 
wait a few moments, and then it will interact with. Now, there's a whole load of more things that we could talk about that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right over Gaze and just say, save yourself a headache. At least when you're prototyping, experiment with using Gaze to interact with things. It's one of the key ways to really reduce the input mechanisms um, that your users are going to need to do. This is not a very well um, contrasted image, but this is an example from a game called um, Hidden Temple. You have a context sensitive cursor at the very center, and that changes as you, as you move around. Okay, so the next point I wanna say is to pay very careful attention to your UI. As I've said before, cardboard um, VR is a great way for getting casual users in. So don't bombard them with complicated UI. Make it big, make it bold, make it simple. Um, the lenses that you will get in cardboard handsets are not fantastic quality. And so sometimes this kind of thing will look great when you are looking at it on an editor, but you'll be surprised that when you view it on an actual cardboard headset, some of the text is pretty difficult to read. So save yourself a headache, and more importantly, save your users a headache and make your UI large, make the text large, make it bold, give it lots of contrast. Here's a familiar picture. I want to talk about using the whole 360 degree space. Now, obviously, Land's End is not on cardboard. I wish you guys would move it over to cardboard. But it's, it, it encompasses a lot of great things that would make a fantastic application on cardboard. But here, specifically, what I want to talk about is using the full 360 degree space. If you ever watch someone using Vive and using Rift, they actually don't look around to the extreme angles as much as you think they would do. It's because they're conscious of the cable that's running down the back of their neck and trailing along the ground. Unless they're very familiar with it, there's a certain amount of VR shuffling that's going along because they don't want to trip over and break something important like, like the headset. But that's not a problem on cardboard. It's not strapped to your face. You can take it off. You keep your spatial awareness. So use that to your advantage. Give people something to look at all around them. Let them explore. But don't treat the space equally. You don't have a great deal of polys. You don't have a great deal of texture to work with. So cluster things in the areas that you want your user to focus on. It doesn't mean everything else has to be bare, but don't treat the space equally because 360 degrees is a lot of space and it's not equal. Okay, so the final point that I want to talk about is something that we actually kicked off uh, this tech thread with, audio. Um, now, we all know that audio is super important when it comes to VR, but I'm concerned that cardboard developers might decide to put audio on a bit of a back burner because it's just a cardboard device, right? No. Good quality audio can really help lo-fi artwork. If you have non-animating textures um, on, let's say, uh, a river or a stream, if you have non-animated geometry, say on trees, by adding 3D positional sound of water traveling through a river or wind rustling through trees, it will create a more immersive experience for your users. It can be hard to describe, but if you've tried it yourself, you'll know there's absolutely no doubt about it. You can almost believe you can see things moving. So on cardboard, it's so easy to plug in headphones and experience that, so don't discount that. There is another side to audio as well, and that's using the speaker of the phone. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that cardboard is a really sociable experience, or can be a really sociable experience, and you can enhance this by using the speaker on the phone. Allow the spectators to hear what's going on, create interest and curiosity so that they want to say, hey, let me see that, that sounds really interesting. So just to summarize, Limit the user input mechanics. Keep it as simple as you can. Put that at the heart of your cardboard design. Use clear and simple UI. Use the whole 360 degree space and use spatial audio. Don't forget about that. Yeah, and um, just to jump onto that point at the end about audio specifically. Um, so just on the technical end again, you know, that helps, again, if we can limit the work of the GPU and we can use audio to replace mesh geometry you know, effects even, um, great. You know, so just you know, don't forget that in your process of potential optimization. So I want to move on now to talking, though, about the GPU. And again, this is where the, um, the 
difficulty lies with mobile hardware, and so getting this right should do a lot to help you, you know, optimize the rest of the game as such. The first thing I'm going to talk about, and I apologize because I expect there's different people with different technical levels, so you may know about all this stuff already, some of you and some of you probably don't, but um, I'll try to be as succinct and quick as possible. But draw calls. Draw calls are really important, and so draw calls are basically when a message, a message is sent to the graphics card to render a mesh. And so you know, draw calls are necessary in order to have anything rendered at all, but it's how we use draw calls and make them efficient that's really important. So basically, when a draw call occurs, a buffer is created, which has data populated in that buffer, and then that buffer is then sent over to, G to the GPU to, to then render. The, the problem with this process, though, is the creation of the buffer initially is actually quite time-consuming and uh, basically quite, you know, gives a lot of overhead. And what we want to try and do instead is fill those buffers with more information so we have less buffers with more in rather than more buffers with less. So there's two processes you really need to just take to account when you're um, trying to decrease your draw um, call count, basically. And um, to make this work like in most engines, like Unity or Unreal, etc., they use this concept of shared material. So you share material amongst several objects. And this is so the engine knows they can be sort of mixed together or um, you know, yeah, be rendered together in some fashion. So the first process is to use batching. So batching, um, yeah, static batching and dynamic batching, but what batching will do is take a group of sub-meshes and put them into a, like a larger parent as such, which represents those um, children. And then when that render happens, it just uses this, um, this large mesh it's created instead, rather than the previous small meshes that made it up before. Um, again, this is just so, you know, imagining that buffer, that's now full of information, and not, we're not having to make lots of individual ones. So with that process to work as well, or with batching to really work as well, you need to use another um, technique called um, atlasing. And so basically, this is taking textures which you could traditionally put onto separate individual image files, say, or PNGs or whatever you want to use, and then rather than having them separate, you put them onto one large um, sheet, basically, and then your models will reference sort of, their UVs will reference smaller parts of this massive texture. And so again, this just aids the batching process and allows you to share, ma share materials properly, but also actually is more efficient because it loads less textures in. And it's better to have a larger texture, uh, like one large texture rather than lots of small ones. One other just thought in terms of how um, draw, um, yeah, um, draw calls can potentially increase is the use of multi-pass shaders. I'm going to show you a few examples, really. Um, so presume this is batched from whatever else, so, um, and a cardboard rendering process has seven batches associated to it before you even start it. So there's nine batches in the corner, you probably can't see it's tiny, but so this is basically two batches, one for the left eye, one for the right eye. If I go to this next one, again, this is going to be really hard to see, but there's actually a black outline now around the um, sphere. So this is done with a multi-pass shader, and so um, like cell shading, for example, um, this black outline is done in a separate pass, but with every pass you do, it costs two batches because you're rendering to two eyes again. And so if you had loads of materials in your scene, you, know, you could easily increase um, the draw call unintentionally by 10 or 20 batches just because you have, say, cell-shaded outline and you're not sharing your materials effectively. And I just want to show you how you sometimes work around those things. So this is to two draw calls again. But what we've done instead is use an atlas, um, and the UVs of the edges, the black edges, are referencing a very small subset of a master texture, basically. So it draws black instead of white. And so we achieve a very similar effect without the same cost of having to use the multipass shader. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about lighting as well. And, um, my, my best suggestion is if you can avoid using the actual lighting engine, um, I would recommend it uh, if possible. Um, there'll be, you know, obviously reasons to take why you could or can't do that, but also potentially consider if you can research an alternative method. And so, for example, this is a project, um, yeah, one of, from one of our recent projects where rather than use the lighting engine, I just wrote a, um, or edited a shader that basically 
I can specify a point where a light is, and if the pixels are facing towards it, it just gets lit with a ramp, which represents shadows, basically. And so it doesn't have to work out um, you know, dynamic shadows or anything like that. It's just all red from the texture. And it doesn't cast shadows out either. But again, for a Toon game, for example, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you are going to use lighting, um, really consider carefully um, what is statically lit and what is dynamically lit. And if you're static lighting stuff, you should be able to bake that into light maps and you know, um, help that out. But, and really consider your choice of lights careful as well. If you're going to use, say, a point light, um, the batch count can easily jump up by tens on dynamic objects. And that's, that's you know, considering trying to get lower than 50, that's like half your budget nearly gone. Um, and yeah, so this stuff can then be fed towards the art direction um, side of things again. And you know, that can be worked out. You know, things can work around can be worked out for this stuff. Right, yeah, so art direction. Everything that Lucas just said to you might scare you off, might make you think, what can you actually do visually with cardboard with so many limitations that are on you? Um, and that's absolutely true if you want to maintain 60 frames per second and you absolutely do want to maintain that. Simple advice at the very beginning, keep it simple. If you start from a console level quality or even a mobile um, 3D non-VR game and try and scale that down, you will find yourself making so many compromises in terms of texture size and geometry and lighting that the end results are not going to be consistent. And at worst, they may be muddled. It's far better to take the limitations of mobile VR to heart and build a consistent, simplified art style from the ground up. So one way of doing this, of course, is by using low polys, flat colors, and simple textures. Painter textures tend to work a lot better than photo textures. Take the low polys, take the limitations of this, and build it into the style of the game that you're looking to create. So it creates something that is emotionally and visually appealing. Paint or bake in complex lighting. Um, again, painting in textures is so much better than using photographic textures and will give you, your artists, a lot more control about the end results. If you're going to use a light source, and Lucas has recommended against it, but if you're going to use it, use one and make sure that you really see the benefit of it. It can add a lot of depth to your scene, but you're going to have to balance that elsewhere. Okay, so in some ways, we're talking about a back-to-basics approach with art direction. We're talking about art school levels of color theory. Use contrasting and complementary colors to guide your user around the environment. You don't need a huge texture budget or lots of polys to allow your environment to communicate to the user and create something that's visually compelling for them. This isn't a game that's on cardboard. But it's a game that could be on cardboard if you remove some of the additional special effects. It doesn't show so well here on this slide, but it has a great use of color. You really know where to look, what's important, and it draws you into the experience. Generally, you're not going to have the budget of using much special effects, but there are times where a little bit of use of particles or a little bit use of um, shader effects on screens can actually save you having to use polys or textures to represent that. Um, for example, a little bit of mist at the bottom of a waterfall or a little bit of dust particles in the air. Yes, this stuff is expensive, but if it's balanced elsewhere, you actually might find it a more efficient way to communicate what's going on to your user. So let's quickly summarize before I hand over. Use a simple, stylized art from the very beginning. Build it into your experience. Use color and tone to guide the user through. Not everything has to be pictorially represented. People understand color far better than you realize, um, and tone as well. So use that. That stuff is relatively cheap. 
and simple effects can add a lot to the art experience, but use them carefully. Yeah, and you know, as Neil said, this is all about balancing um, you know, demands as such. Um, and I want to talk about this next topic, especially about the particle side of things and wherever else, where um, this cost can be sneakily introduced and you don't sort of realize it. Um, basically, it's the concept of fill rate and overdraw. So fill rate is actually how many pixels GPU can write, like a texture, say, in a period of time, so like a second or so. The thing with, um, again, mobile GPUs are weak and not quite the same. So again, it's just more of a consideration of something you've got to think about. Um, and I want to talk about overdraw and show, try and explain an example. It's a little bit hard to explain just with slides and with limited time, but I'll try my best. Um, so basically, let's take this example on the right-hand side. So you see a black plane representing like a background object, a wall, etc., and this sphere representing like you know a piece of the environment, a table, a chair in the environment, um, which is more towards the foreground. Um, and so when batches happen, they get rendered in separate stages. So um, that could represent one stage, that could represent another, and then together on the same texture, they'll make this stage. Consider for a moment the difference in the order that they're rendered. And so, for example, if you rendered this background first and then placed the sphere on top, now, that, that's fine and will render and look correct. The issue you've got, though, is where the sphere has actually occluded this set, set of pixels behind it here, that work's been wasted because those black pixels that have already been rendered in this shot are gone. You can't see them. What's the point? They, they shouldn't have been you know, done. And basically, one way you can be a little bit effective with your fill rate is to avoid writing those pixels together. So what you do instead is you render the sphere first and then, and then the background to get this same image again. But the difference is, is that those sort of selection the pixels in the center here, when the shader is checking if it should render them or not, it will actually, actually discard the pixels and not bother rendering them instead of, in the previous example, having rendered them already and then having them overwritten as such. So that's, you know, if you expand that example up to include a room with loads of different environmental objects, if you say to your like, walls in your sort of outer environment to draw after the rest of the environmental objects have been drawn, you'll have some instances where actually pixels don't have to be rendered or you know, a large portion of pixels are blocked off and they, they aren't rendered anymore. And you're helping to reduce that fill rate. Um, and then with particles and um, things like that, so just bear in mind, just because an object's transparent doesn't mean it's not still rendered or writing to pixels. And so, for example, you might have a particle effect, you know, floating in the scene with lots of particles. Now, bear in mind, you do see the particle, but they are also rendered onto a quad, each individual particle. And so, if, you know, something that can get quite easily go out of control is if you have loads of particles crossing your view, and they're all writing to the same set of pixels and contributing to overdraw. And this example on the left-hand side is just showing it's for spheres, like not necessarily particles, but if you, for example, depending on the rendering order of those spheres, if it rendered back to front, towards us, it could render those colored pixels again, again and again and again and again and again, probably about 10 times, 10 spheres I put there. And that's wasted work. You shouldn't need to do that. Um, if you're clever with your rendering order, you can work around this. And the last thing I just wanted to add to that is actually you can gain quite a quick efficiency saving uh, with cardboard if you actually just lower the resolution of the end um, cardboard render texture or the end cardboard texture you see when you're wearing the headset. If you lower it by, say, 20%, for example, um, you could save yourself, you know, considering it's 60 frames a second, at least as rendering, you know, that's, you know, 20% could be, you know, maybe a couple hundred pixels, 300, 400 pixels, um, which, you know, is actually quite a saving, and you lose a little bit of definition, but in return, you may get a more consistent frame rate and something that can handle the throttling side better, potentially. And I, I just want to add then about post-processing effects as well. Um, the post-processing effects are expensive too, and again, there might be circumstances where it's worth using one because you can save elsewhere. But just bear in mind that for post-processing effects, you have to do it to both eyes. So again, this is double the cost or double the work that has to be done. Um, I mean, it's a little bit lower because the, the resolution of each eye may not be as high, but there's still uh, a, an associated cost with having two of them. Um, 
But then just bear in mind, you know, if there's other techniques and other ways to potentially do the same effect. And one example might be, for example, rather than have this grayscale effect as something you apply afterwards, why not apply that grayscale effect to a set of models or textures um, you have in game, and then maybe you can substitute them out in some fashion. And it's just sort of clever things like that where, um, or yeah, it's just clever things like that where if you can identify other efficient ways of doing an effect very similar to it, which you know reduces um, almost the need for, the, for work at the same time, um, that's always worth thinking about. I mean, these are all the lessons, you know, the main lessons on the GPU side, and there's you know plenty of other lessons to work as work out as well. Right, so if you're thinking right now, it sounds like mobile VR has more in common with mobile apps than it does with the Rift or the Vive. You're absolutely right. And with this in mind, I think there are some lessons that we can learn from existing mobile apps and how they can help us make better cardboard apps. Now, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again, keep it simple. It doesn't mean that your game or product has to be simple underneath or that your thinking has to be simple, but its presentation, its interaction model to the user has to be simple, has to be clear. If you have a product that requires no instructions or three lines of instructions, that's ideal. Um, cardboard has the potential of being a first-time VR experience for a lot of people, so do it well. Um, because a bad experience can actually put people off VR for quite a while. Make the experience short and sweet. About five to ten minutes for session length is ideal for this. Um, create natural breaks in your product. Allow people to naturally walk away um, from your VR experience. This also has the added benefit of letting the GPU have a little rest, which it will desperately need by that point and make your application quick to get into and quick to get out of. Make it shareable. Mobile VR, as I've said before, can be really sociable, but help people um, to make it sociable. Make it easy to pause the experience. Make it easy to repeat the experience. Have a good audio coming out of the speaker so people can understand what's going on and have that second narrative that's listenable by the spectator. And a final point, and this is true of all applications on mobile, test early, test often. Performance testing is incredibly important for mobile VR. Not only is it very difficult to do, but there are so many different phones out there, and they can act strangely when their GPU has been running close to 100% for 10 or 20 minutes. Some really weird things can happen. Yeah, and so the conclusion or really, you know, with all that, and I really emphasize actually first actually about the testing that you need to um, yeah do that. And I mean, I'm speaking from a technical perspective as well. There's all sorts of you know horrible surprises you can slightly find out uh, uh, a little bit later than you realize. But anyway, that's all fine. Um, so just do that. But um, the conclusion really from my side, you know, basically with all this and all the advice I've given you, this is all um, about. You know, a set of factors which you're compromising and trying to balance, and that's the crucial thing. You're trying to balance these things. You know, the advice I've given, the advice we've both given, you know, you may find, you know, you don't need to follow that quite so tightly. You may find in your circumstances, for example, you have different expenses. And I only expect anyway that cardboard development should hopefully get easier as the hardware gets better, as the SDK gets more and more um, sort of worked out, and uh, the standards are identified as well. And so. And you know, this could have been just a talk where you know I gave you loads of technical you know, babble and you know whatever else. But I think the reason Anil and I are presenting this together today is the fact that actually it takes more than just a technician to <coughs> essentially work out some of these problems. It takes the team working collectively to actually sometimes find solutions to problems which you know if you just worked on your own as a technical person, you might not actually be able to come to. It's about making the uncompromisable compromisable. Lucas is right. Design, art, and code need to work together to create an optimized application, and optimization is king here. The art and design choices that you make at the very beginning of your product can have a dramatic effect on your ability to optimize it later and have it run on as many handsets as possible. 
Google Cardboard is a fantastic platform. We love working on it. We love how many potential people can see our product that we have created. Um, but understand its strengths, understand its limitations, put that at the core of your product, and that is the key to creating a compelling Google Cardboard experience. Thank you for listening. Thank you.